Hi everyone, we're gonna get started. Um, I just wanted to give people a few minutes to get in, uh, but we have a pretty tight presentation. So hello, uh, welcome to this evening's Healthy Living series presentation, Understanding Anxiety in Children and Helping Them Cope with Lynn Lyons and Dr. Steve Chapman. I'm Angelica. Uh, I work in community relations here at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Uh, quickly, I'd like to thank Project Launch and Chad Children's Hospital at Dartmouth Hitchcock for their partnership in producing this timely and important presentation. A couple of housekeeping items. Tonight's presentation will be recorded and posted to our website um, in the coming weeks. If you have questions for our presenters, please use the Zoom Q&A feature and our moderators will assist in fielding your questions. We do only have 15 minutes of Q&A, so we will try to get to as many questions as we can here tonight. Um, and finally, there will be a survey at the end of our presentation. It only takes a couple of minutes to complete, so if you'd indulge us by filling that out, it helps us to plan future programming. Uh, thank you again for being with us tonight, and I'm going to hand it over to Logan Seeley. She's our project coordinator at Project Launch. So, Logan, all you. Thank you, Angelica. And hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, so this hour, as Angelica said, is a collaboration between Project Launch, between CHAD, and between Dartmouth's uh, Healthy Living series. Upper Valley Project Launch is funded by SAMHSA with the aim to promote the wellness of young children by addressing physical, social, emotional, cognitive aspects of development. Our project specifically aims to increase our community's ability to identify, engage, and serve at-risk trauma-affected families with early intervention services. We work to meet young children and families where they are in terms of physical location and their development and their needs through a four-tiered approach. Number one, raising public awareness. Number two, uh, screening children and their care caregivers in primary care clinics across the region. Number three, providing targeted supports to enhance engagement and increase access to care. And number four, the delivery of two evidence-based parenting interventions, circle of security and helping the non-compliant. To learn more about Project Launch, you can visit our Facebook page at Upper Valley Project Launch. And tonight, we're really excited to bring to you two amazing professionals, Lynn Lyons and Dr. Steve Chapman. Lynn Lyons is an internationally recognized psychotherapist, author, and speaker with a special interest in interrupting the generational patterns of anxiety in families. She is the co-author with Reed Wilson of Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents, and the companion book for kids, Playing with Anxiety, Casey's Guide for Teens and Kids. She is also the author of Using Hypnosis with Children, Creating and Delivering Effective Interventions, and has multiple online programs for parents and children. She maintains a private practice in Concord, New Hampshire, where she sees families whenever she is not on the road teaching or on Zoom teaching. Um, and Dr. Steve Chapman is a general pediatrician with over 25 years of experience working with families. He is the medical director of the Boyle Community Pediatrics Program at the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth where he teaches advocacy and develops clinic community collaborations. He served four years in the National Health Service Corps and just completed his three-year term as president of the New Hampshire Pediatric Society. He is currently school physician for his local Dresden School District, where he himself was a student many years ago. He is a core investigator at the National Institute on Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network uh, in the Northeast Node. And he works with Dartmouth Center for Addiction recovery, pregnancy and parenting, as well as moms in recovery. Once again, everyone, thank you for being here tonight. And I'm going to pass it over to Lynn. Great, thank you, Logan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me tonight. And um, thank you to the project for including me in this. Such a, such a great project and such important uh, work that is done to help our families in, in, in New Hampshire. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in because we want to make sure that you all get some great information and concrete information. Um, and as Logan was saying, I am sitting here in my office in Concord. I still have an office and I still see families. So I am still in the mix of dealing with all of the anxiety that is a problem now and certainly was a, a problem before the pandemic. But um, um, I think now what, what 
I'm experiencing is what I call worry rookies, right? People who, who said, I've never felt this way before, or people seeing anxiety in their kids, and they said they, they were never anxious before. But be, we're living in a time of uncertainty, to put it mildly. And so as we're trying to make this decision, and people are trying to figure out, should I send my kid back to school? What is my school doing? Right? We, we, feel like, we feel like we have to make the right decision. We feel like we have to figure this all out. We feel like we have to know exactly what we're doing, which is why this is so difficult. Anxiety has two demands. Regardless of what you're anxious about, regardless of whether or not you've been diagnosed or not diagnosed, anxiety says, I need to have certainty and comfort. I need to know exactly what's gonna happen and I need to feel comfortable as I'm moving through my life. Well, not only is that impossible during normal times, but it's certainly not possible now when things are changing, sometimes on a daily basis. <clears throat> so when we look at what we know about kids that are anxious and in particular, when we look at kids that we know are anxious that also might have worried parents because one thing we know from the research is that anxiety sort of hangs out in families is that there are four things that we know about kids that are raised in worried environments and i'm going to tell you these things because it's important for you to know sort of what we're working with and then perhaps more importantly i'm going to tell you how to address these things and even better yet how to get ahead of these things so the four things that we know about kids that are raised in worried environments is, like I was just saying, not surprisingly, they're lousy at tolerating uncertainty. The other thing we know about kids that are raised in worried environments is that they're not very good independent problem solvers. The third thing is that when we measure their autonomy, their sense of mastery, their sense of independence in the world, well, it tends to be not quite where we'd like it to be. And the fourth thing we know about kids raised in worried environments is that they perceive the world as a more dangerous place. So if we look at those four things, tolerating uncertainty, creating independent problem solvers, allowing for autonomy, and, and what we convey about the world as a dangerous place, that gives us a lot to work with as we, as we step into this new phase. The first phase that we went through with all of this pandemic stuff that was sort of, there was the panic phase and there was certainly a lot of uncertainty and it was kind of all or nothing. And we were shut down, schools were closed, we all had to figure it out, it felt a little chaotic. And then we've gone through the summer and we're sort of trying to wait and see what's gonna happen and now we have to make this other big decision. So a lot of this worry and anxiety is coming back up, both for, for adults and parents and certainly teachers and administrators and everybody trying to make these decisions and for kids as well. So here's, here's what I want you to keep in mind as you're helping your family navigate these, these bumpy times. The first is that anxiety is all about rigidity, right? Because remember, it wants certainty and comfort. I like to imagine anxiety as a cult leader, right, out there. And, and you know, if you've hung around with a cult leader, is that they like when you obey their demands. Right? If you're in a cult and you listen to the cult leader, everything goes fairly smoothly. When you disobey the cult leader, that's when things get problematic. So imagine your anxiety, and I even tell families, right? Pull it out, give it a name, right? Call it, call it Stella, call it Joanne, call it Pete, and listen to what the anxiety is demanding. It's demanding rigidity. It wants to know exactly what's gonna happen. And if you're dealing with a, with a younger child, who's feeling very anxious, right? You might, you might notice that they, they like to know what the plan is. One of the mistakes that we make is that when somebody is feeling anxious, when a child is feeling anxious, when a student is feeling anxious, we try and give the anxiety what it wants by making sure that we just give a lot of information that everybody knows the plan, that, that, that we, we get ahead of it, right? That we scaffold, that we say, this is how the day is gonna go. Now that's not what I recommend in normal times because it's hard to pull off and it's certainly hard to pull off now. So instead of buying into the rigidity of what anxiety wants, think flexibility, think adaptability. 
The thing I talk to parents about a lot, and I, I use this metaphor with kids all the time too, is that there is a difference between being a uncooked piece of spaghetti and a cooked piece of spaghetti. Uncooked piece of spaghetti and I'll have kids in my office. Like, let's pretend that we're an uncooked piece of spaghetti. Sometimes I'll just go into my kitchen and get a piece of uncooked spaghetti. My office is attached to my house. And so we talk about being uncooked spaghetti. You might even take that spaghetti and, and hand everybody in your family a piece of uncooked spaghetti. If there are teachers listening, hand your first graders, give them a piece of uncooked spaghetti and tell them to tie it in a knot. And of course that spaghetti breaks into a bunch of different pieces. What we need you to be right now, you say to your kids, is cooked spaghetti. We need to be flexible. We need to be able to contort ourselves into different shapes and sometimes even tie ourselves into knots. Flexibility and adaptability happen when we give kids permission to not know exactly what's coming next. I see a lot of plans written for kids that are anxious, a lot of accommodation plans, a lot of 504 plans. And, and the thing that I see most frequently is let's make sure they know exactly what's going to happen. It backfires and it's going to backfire now. Now, look, it's not all or nothing, right? Because anxiety likes all or nothing too. We want to be able to know that there are times when plans and rules and certainly now protocols and things we need to do are very important, but how do we make sure that we are injecting flexibility into that too? So parents, one of the things that you can do, and, and this is preventative, and this is good even when we're not in a pandemic, is to get used to talking to your kids about the mites and maybes of life. Get used to talking to them about how they're cooked spaghetti. One of the things that I do all the time with families, and I recommend that teachers do this in classrooms as well, is to have a little wall of flexibility in your house. Pick a piece of, you know, pick a, pick a pantry door, pick a piece of wall, put up a little board in your, in your kitchen, get a bunch of sticky notes. And every time that you notice that your child is handling something flexibly, you just write down a few words. You know, wanted, the, wanted to wear his red socks, but they were in the wash, so he wore his blue socks. And put it up on the wall of flexibility. Celebrate the ability to be adaptable. One of the things that, that I think is great to ask kids on a regular basis is, what was something unexpected that happened today, and how did you handle it? The unexpected thing of the day. And you as parents should be modeling this. You should be, you should be talking out loud in front of your children about how you handle unexpected things based on their age, right? So if you have to make something up, that's fine. You don't want to say, you know, uh, unexpected, you know, the, the transmission in the car went and I don't have money to fix it. And so now I have to, right, keep it, keep it simple, right? I, I went to go get milk out of the refrigerator for my coffee and there was no milk. And it was so unexpected. So what did I do? What do you think I did? Well, I went into the freezer and I got out the vanilla ice cream and I put that in my coffee instead. Very good solution. So you wanna to talk to your kids about the mites and the maybes. One of the mistakes we also make, particularly if you have a child that tends to be a worrier and during this uncertain time, is that we get into the trap of providing reassurance over and over and over again. So we, we call it content-based reassurance. So do we want to give kids information? Of course, right? It's not, we're not gonna just throw them out into the world and tell them to figure things out. It's good to have a schedule. It's good to have a routine. It's good to know when we do know what's coming next. But it's so important for us to be able to say to kids, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And so when they ask that question over and over again, am I, is my teacher going to be nice? Am I going to be sick? And we, we try and give the answers, but it's okay to say, right, that sounds like Pete talking, right? Because we pulled the worry out and we've named it Pete. And Pete always wants to know everything. The great thing about externalizing the worry is that then you and your child can have a conversation with Pete. And you can give Pete a piece of your mind. You can say, Pete, knock it off. You know what? Andrew's trying to figure out how to get ready for first grade and then you show up and you're all catastrophic and you're like, I can't handle it. Knock it off, Pete, because Andrew's figuring out how to step into his life and how to manage. We can't know everything. We're going to roll around in the mites and maybes of life. The other thing I want you to pay attention to, parents, is the use of catastrophic language. 
So right now, things can feel kind of catastrophic. What catastrophic parents do in general is that they will give the safety instruction, which is fine. You tell your son, you know, I need you to wear your mask or I need you to put your helmet on when you're riding your bike. And then catastrophic parents want to back that up with some really good scary information to get them to pay attention. If you have a child that's a worrier, if you yourself as a worrier, remember that fourth thing, they perceive the world as a more dangerous place. So you can give the safety information, but resist the impulse then to scare the bejesus out of them. I had a mom a while ago and she would say, well, I'm, I'm teaching my child to stay home alone a little bit because he's 11 and he can stay home alone while I go to the grocery store and such. So I'm teaching kids, how to, I, I'm teaching my child how to stay home alone. I said, well, how do you go about doing that? She said, well, I give them the instructions, right? So after, you leave, after I leave, I need you to close the door and lock it and not let anybody in. So that's perfectly fine. But then she would say, and let me explain to you why. Because there are people out there that will steal you. Do you understand? So I could come back from the grocery store and you're gone and I never see you again. And then they end up in my office and she's saying, he won't sleep in his own bed or he's terrified to stay alone. So, so zip it on the catastrophic language. Even when you think they're not listening, when, when adults are talking about things with a sense of seriousness and a sense of, of import, little ears tune in. So I, uh, one mom said to me the other day, um, not thinking her child was listening, um, I know this is going to be terrifying when we go back to school, right? That kind of language is not going to help anybody step in and manage what we have to manage. So pay attention to your catastrophic language. It can be a habit that you don't even know about, right? And if you tend to be a worried parent, pull out your worry and give it a name. Say, you know, this is Edith or this is Peggy. And then tell your kids, when Edith shows up, let me know. We want to start to interrupt those patterns that we know keep worry going. The other thing that you should know is that as I'm saying that you're, you're not going to model catastrophic language, here's what I do want you to do. Right now, we're worried about how this is going to go. And it, it, some parents are worried about academics and what's going to happen. And did my child get behind because I, you know, the remote learning was a bit chaotic in the spring. And older parents are thinking, what's my, <clears throat> what's my son's transcript going to look like because he's entering his junior year and I wanted to get into a good college. This is not the time for academic rigor. The beginning of the school year needs to be a time of connection, a time of warmth, a time of certainly a time of structure, and also a time of fun ritual. One of the things that may be different depending on how your school is, is doing all of this is that, is that the rituals that kids depend on and that parents really depend on too have all gotten a little lost. So certainly at the end of the school year, we had, we had um, kids sort of end second grade and not have that move up day, not be able to go into the school and meet their new teacher. So we wanna be able to create some fun ritual now that helps kids make this passage between last year and this year because it got so interrupted. So I've been talking with a lot of schools about how we can do that and how you can do that as a parent. Maybe if your child is doing remote learning or if they're not gonna be going on the school bus or if the school schedule is a little funky compared to what it was, if you're deciding to keep your child home for all the reasons that are, are valid to do that, create some sort of first day of school ritual and some sort of transition ritual. So um, one family I talked to, um, they, they have a child who's moving from first grade to second grade. They're gonna bake cookies in the shape of number ones and they're gonna eat those cookies on the day before school. And then they're gonna bake cookies in the shape of number twos and then they're gonna eat the two cookies after the first day of second grade or maybe they're gonna have them for breakfast too. Being able to have a parade, being able to have some silliness, being able to have some joy in your household is going to be much more important than whether or not your child retained his or her times tables. Joy and your ability to convey joy to your children right now is essential. Human beings 
and children in particular are pretty darn resilient. And what they are going to remember about this is how the adults handled it. They are going to remember what you conveyed and what you said, and it's not that you have to be perfect, but stay away from the catastrophic language, how it is that you talk to them about this. Even in really difficult times, even in scary times, even in uncertain times like these, we are capable of provide, providing moments of joy and worth and, dare I say, silliness for our children. One of the things that kids remember is novelty in a good way. So if you can think about how it is in these last weeks of summer before school starts, what can you do with your kids that will feel joyful? It doesn't have to be a big production. It can be a small thing. It can be that, that you can tell them for dinner one night, you can tell them that you're making something that you know they don't really like, right? You tell them, and, but what you're really doing is you're having ice cream sundaes for dinner. You can, you can rent their favorite movie and pop popcorn. You can play a game. You can have backwards day. You can come down in the morning wearing clown makeup if your kids don't freak out at clowns. Anything that you can do that can allow them to see that you are still capable of joy. They are looking to you to set the tone. They are absolutely needing you to handle the uncertainty in a way that doesn't make it worse for them. I've been talking to a lot of teachers and going into schools, which I usually do at the beginning of the school year. And it's different this year because we're not, we're, we're, I, I'm talking about how we're managing something that's so unprecedented, of course, we're all tired of that word. And what I am saying to these teachers is that if you are in school with these kids, if, if, the, if the school system has decided that you are showing up live, then you need to bring it. You need to, you need to show these kids that you are attentive, that you are focused, and that you are feeling joyful. And, I, and some of them will say, oh, but I, that's, a, that's a lot to ask. I know it's a lot to ask, but it's so, so important. Um, I was, uh, I've told this story a bunch of times, but my uh, parents were down in Florida when the pandemic hit. They live up in um, New London, actually, during the summertime. And um, they weren't going to come back. They canceled their flights. Flights weren't leaving during March and all that kind of stuff. And when the governor of Florida made the announcement that he was going to start to open Florida, uh, my parents said, we're getting out of here. So they got on a plane. They did all the necessary things that they needed to do. Um, they flew home. They were fine. They quarantined. About a week after my parents were home, my mom sent me a little video. My dad, who had just turned 79, loves 50s music. And so he was blasting on Spotify his 50s music, and he was vacuuming, and he was dancing. My mom took a video of my 79-year-old dad doing the twist to his 50s music while he was vacuuming. It was about a 30-second video. I I'm 54 years old. My dad is 79 years old. It made me feel better about how things were in the world because my dad was dancing. This is what I am saying to all of the parents that I'm talking to and to the teachers and to the educators. They are depending on us. It is not a time for us to go around with furrowed brows and catastrophic language. It is also not a time for us to pretend that we can provide certainty for our kids. We can provide them love and empathy and validation. We can help them talk about their feelings. We can validate their feelings. We can give them emotional literacy, which is the ability to identify and put words to what they are feeling. We can do it in expressive ways. We can do it in verbal ways if they're old enough to do that verbally. But it is our job to make sure that we are setting the tone. It is normal to worry. It is not going away. Our systems are set up to worry. We're capable of imagining things that haven't happened yet. That's our higher level thinking. That process is going to be there. But we as the adults need to show our children that even during tough times, even during scary times, we can connect, 
we can be warm, and we can be joyful, and we can be playful. So the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'll hand it over to Steve, who's waiting to, to um, give his, his um, input as well, is that one of the exercises that I've been giving families um, throughout all of this is that I want you to pick a day. And during that day, and maybe you decide it's Wednesday, or maybe you decide it's Wednesday and Friday. Maybe you decide it's four days a week, but just pick a day and say in your family, we are gonna do three things. Everybody is going to do three things that brighten somebody else's day. And it can be small, it can be big, it can be for somebody in your family, it can be for a stranger in the grocery store, but let's get out of our own heads because that's where anxiety lives. Let's get out of our own heads and let's start helping kids and model for them how being externally connected doing things that are meaningful for other people helps our mood and helps our own anxiety An external connection and feeling as if you are doing meaningful things. These are helpful for people that are anxious and depressed and they are preventative for kids that are going through tough times. So on that note, I hope I've given you some, some things to think about, some concrete things to do as we move into this time. Remember, right, we want problem solvers, we want autonomy, give your kids things to do on their own, let them feel a sense of control, give them choices. We wanna stay away from that catastrophic language. And even though there are things that we need to deal with out there that are certainly dangerous, let's make room for joy and exploration and connection and fun and novelty and replenish your buckets as best you can in the beautiful August weather that we're having in New Hampshire so you're ready to go when school starts. Thanks everybody. Steve, take it from there. I will, I will, uh, I will mute myself and I will stop my video. Great, thank you, Lynn. Boy, that was, that was really fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just speak for, um, for a few minutes and so that we can get to questions and a conversation. So, so I'm a general pediatrician and I've been working with our local school district and a few other school districts around. Um, and I've also been seeing a lot of, talking with a lot of families and a lot of kids um, about um, school coming up and decisions to make and how to be prepared. And, um, you know, it, it's really just struck me lately that, um, that whilst things are so different and things are not the same and these are unprecedented times, um, there are, there's a lot that hasn't changed. There's a lot that isn't different. Um, the anticipation of a new school year, the teacher I haven't met yet, um, the uncertainty about how I'll fit in, the excitement about going into a classroom, the excitement about learning new things, those are still there for kids and that's still gonna be part of the experience. But surely it is different. Um, you know, remember when you were a kid, how long a summer would seem? You know, it was basically an infinite amount of time. It was almost not even worrying of thinking about like, gosh, what will I do when the fall comes? It was so, so long. And you think about, you know, what that's like for kids um, now that go all the way back to March. You know, that's two or three summers worth on top of each other. And so it does take a little bit of extra thought and a little bit of extra preparation. And the only way to do this, aside from thinking about worry and how to handle that, I think is with kindness and community, that we do this together, um, that we think about the challenges that are ahead, not as things to be avoided, but as things that we're gonna help our kids through and that we're gonna do this together. And let's listen, let me listen to you. Let me hear where you are right now. And as Lynn says, you know, this is a really good conversation to begin even before school starts. You know, what, are, what do you feel about it? What are you looking forward to? What do you think about going back? And of course, school districts are doing all sorts of different things around here. Not, it's not a uniform response. Some are going back full time in person. Some are doing different hybrid models. Some are doing remote. And in the middle of all that, you know, parents are making their choices and families are making their choices about how to respond um, to those options that each school is given. 
And there really is no right answer um, for everybody, but there is a first step. And that there is that, how do we get started on that very first day? Um, this is gonna be a transition for everybody. It's that transition for kids. Um, it's a transition for parents. And it's surely gonna be a transition for teachers who haven't been in the classroom in a long time um, or doing a hybrid model really ever, um, who are dealing with worry and anxiety themselves. And so that transition period is going to be really, really important. Absolutely, academics are not the first thing. The first thing is community building, connection, and we can do this together. Going to school is not just about avoiding harm. It's about being together. It's about joy and play and collaboration and cooperation and facing challenges and not being quite sure if I can do it and trying and figuring it out and doing that together. You know, that's where kids are heading back to. And so, you know, framing this as, um, I mean, we have to think about how do we keep safe? We have to, I mean, that is, that is the first thing. But we have to prepare our kids and anticipate as adults and parents, that joyous part of learning and what schools offer kids and offer each other. Kids miss each other. You know, I hear that in, I heard that in clinic probably seven times today. Um, you know, I miss my friends, I miss being, um, you know, seeing people, I miss, um, you know, just bumping into somebody. I miss making new friends. Um, social, emotional, and development happens in groups, and it just can't happen um, through a remote screen. And kids know that, and they're anticipating going back. Um, as a parent, we need to talk with our kids about their worries and how to keep them safe. But we can also anticipate and plan for and reflect that anticipation of joy and excitement. Day two is gonna be different from day one. You know, what we're thinking about is how do we get started? Um, but I think we need to be ready for that day two um, and day three and how this builds. And so that conversation to start now about what are you thinking, how do you feel, is just as important on day one and going on to day two is how did it go? What was it like? And to really listen and to engage. Part of resilience is facing those challenges with the right support to make it through. And boy, there's nobody else better to do that than a parent. A few more things to think about um, just to get ready, just sort of a little nuts and bolts list, um, is think about sleep. You know, it's been great for some kids. Boy, they've gotten more sleep than ever. Um, and in some ways, teenagers do much better if they sleep a little longer and don't get up as early. Um, you know, and some schools have switched start dates on that basis, but many haven't. But some kids have been doing great with sleep. Some kids have not been doing so great with sleep. Um, I've seen a number of kids sleeping till noon, sleeping till one, sleeping till two. And so regardless of whether it's remote, hybrid, or in person, starting to think about moving the sleep to a schedule that's going to fit the school schedule. And it may be, need to be done in some cases gradually, but that's something to not wait until the first day of school about. Second thing is mask wearing. Um, almost all schools, oh, all schools are um, requiring masks with some exceptions for really, really young kids. Um, but um, get a mask. I'm sure you any, everyone's had them already, but practice the right way to wear it and practice it just being part of what we do. And think of it not just of a safety, I'm going to not get hurt um, thing, but think of it as this is, how we this is how we take care of each other. This is part of how we are in a community. I look out for you by wearing a mask. You look out for me by wearing a mask. And that's just a part of how we come together as a community. One more thing is to think about um, making sure your child's up to date on vaccines and checkups. It's gonna be more important than ever to have a flu vaccine um, this year um, because flu, while we're not into flu season yet, it will be upon us in the fall. And thinking about um, just getting that taken care of um, 
we're open here at Dartmouth Hitchcock. We're safe. We're seeing a lot of people in person and pediatric and family medicine practices across the state um, are as well. One thing on my list that um, Lynn mentioned is um, think about um, what I'm calling a kindness kit to bring to school. And what I mean by that is two pieces of kindness, one for a teacher, one for a classmate. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. It doesn't need to be anything that you bought. It can be something that you say. It can be something that you wrote or drew. You could say to a teacher, thank you for being a teacher. I'm so happy to see you. It can be to a classmate, I missed you all summer. Think about what you're bringing, you're helping your child bring to that first day of school that's helping to make those connections. And the best connections start with kindness. Um, the last thing on my list is that ongoing conversation. And sometimes it's just listening. With your teenagers, it will be mostly just listening. Um, but it's that conversation and that willingness to be there and to share that experience, the, the joys of the first few days, the challenges, the sadnesses, the worries, the challenges. That's, that's really what it's all about. Development, um, there's no developmental stage for which we say staying home is really the best thing for this. Younger kids need social engagement, cooperation, collaboration. They'll be excited to get to that. Older kids need autonomy, a little bit of separation from parents. I can do it myself. Don't tell me what to do. And they're going to need that as well. And they're going to get that and regardless of what type of school they're going back to. So let me finish with that and then we can go to questions, but start the conversation. Um, you know, ask kids, how are you feeling? What are you anticipating? And I'm here for you. Don't get too far ahead of yourselves. Um, you know, it's the first day um, and there's a lot to learn and we'll find out what that brings and we'll go through it together. So um, thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it right over to our moderator. So I think I've been looking at our questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Steve and Lynn. That was, those were both absolutely wonderful presentations. Um, so Becky and I will be moderate, um, doing the questions. Feel free to use the question box to chat, um, chat in your questions. We have a few good ones already queued up. So to start, uh, this one came in right as Steve, right before you were talking about sleeping. So the timing was perfect. So I'll send it to you, Steve, but Lynn, if you have anything to chime in, go for it. And um, so this person's nine-year-old has recently had difficulty, uh, trouble sleeping in her own room and she keeps telling mom that she's scared. Um, and she does suffer some, from some anxiety. So mom is wondering, what is the right thing to do? Uh, she's tried putting her back in her bed, uh, but then she continues to say she's scared. So she's just wondering how to move forward from this and what's the right thing, right strategy to do. So, um, you know, trouble sleeping and fear and sleeping. Um, it's important to listen and to explore that a little bit and um, to find out what, what that really means. Um, being reassuring is important. Being flexible is really important. Um, you know, the answer isn't necessarily, let's get you back in that bed right away. You know, it may be um, figuring out a routine or maybe figuring out um, monster spray to spray in the closet if that's, if there's a monster in there. Um, it might be, um, figuring out, um, you know, the one minute snuggle you get with a parent will lie down for you for a few minutes to make it safe. But there may be something more behind it. And, um, and I'd explore that. Rebuilding the routine and rebuilding that I am here for you and um, I will be there is gonna be important of any part of it. Lynn, do you have uh, more? I'm sure you do. I do, because I deal with this all the time, because um, anxious kids have trouble being in their own beds. So I, I always am interested in addressing the worry, right? But not so much, so if she says she doesn't know what she's scared about, that's fine with me. 
So because worry has a process that it does over and over and over again. And so again, if we pull out the worry and we have a conversation about it, and maybe a child who's nine is able to say, well, I'm worried that there's something scary in my closet or I'm worried that you're far away, right? But we really want to address this worry and how it shows up and how it basically says you can't handle being in your bed and how worry makes your imagination go crazy and you're thinking about all that stuff. The key is, that conversation can't happen at bedtime. That's what I call front loading. You gotta do the conversation ahead of time so that when your little girl, when it's time for her to go to bed, that you guys have come up with a plan. So um, in, in, terms of, in terms of a nine-year-old, um, my approach to this, right? Flexibility is important as Steve says, but also th this gets cemented really quickly. So you can find yourself very quickly having to sleep in the bed with your child or your child is sleeping at the bottom of your bed. I had one family that bought a big L.L. Bean dog bed and they were the kid was sleeping at the bottom. They didn't want to in the bed. So she was sleeping in a dog bed. They was like, yeah, it's a nice dog bed. Um, so you really want to talk to her about how worry works. I would pull out it, I, I would pull out the worry, I would give it a name. Maybe you're gonna write down some things that you're gonna say back to the worry when it shows up. Maybe she's gonna post them on the wall near, near her bed so that she has something to, to refer to. The key to this is that we're not trying to get rid of the worry. So I, don't, I, I never advise a family to do something that gets rid of the worry or that actually goes after trying to get rid of what you're worried about. Um, so I'm not a big fan of monster spray, to be honest, Steve. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I mean, it's, it's okay, but a nine-year-old, right? So, so I really want to address, I want to address how worry works. The other thing too, is you want her to be able to fall asleep in her bed on her own, but it's wonderful, like Steve's saying, to, to let her know that you love her and you're there for her and maybe to have that one minute snuggle right? So it's not about stiff arming her and telling her she has to do it by herself. We're teaching her how to deal with the worry and how she can approach it when it shows up. So I have no problem at all with kids having things in their bed that make them feel comfortable in their bed, as long as it's not a screen. So we're not going to give her an iPad or something like that. But maybe she has a lovey, maybe she has a book that she likes to read, even with a little flashlight. Maybe she has a coloring book so she can learn how to stay in her bed and put herself to sleep. So generally with kids, and, and when, when you come up with a plan ahead of time about how to deal with worry, and you're doing it together as a family, you can nip it in the bud. If she doesn't know what she's scared about, that's not a problem for me, because it could be anything. Um, but helping her, helping her fall asleep on her own. Be really careful about developing the habit of you getting into the bed and falling asleep with her or staying in the bed until she falls asleep. I've got families where there's a 13-year-old, 15-year-old still in that habit. They've never learned how to put themselves to sleep and you don't want to go there. Thanks, Lynn. That was really great. There's been a lot of great questions in the chat, and a lot of people are saying up front, thank you to both Lynn and Steve. This has been really wonderful. So the next question that we wanted to ask, someone is asking, they have a sensitive, anxious child who's starting school for the first time after months of no preschool. And in their situation, they have to drop the child off at a gate to a strange person they haven't been able to meet before because of COVID restrictions. So do you have some thoughts, either one of you, about ways that this parent could help their child adjust to that? You go, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is this is one of the this is like the heartbreaking thing that I'm hearing, you know. Uh, and again, I was talking about these rituals. So for those of for those of us whose kids are older, remember like that first day of kindergarten or preschool and dropping them off, and such a special time for for parents too. And it just feels like a bummer that these things aren't being able to happen. So if you feel sad about it mom, you should, because it is, it is sad. So again, talk to your little child about how worry might show up. Maybe, maybe draw a picture about how worry might show up. But if, if she's not expressing fear yet, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, I can't remember. But if your child isn't expressing it yet, be careful that you don't sort of be too suggestive, right? So that you don't say, oh, this is going to be so hard for you. Or I, it's so, it's going to be so difficult that you can't, right? So, so take your lead from your child. 
If your child is able to do it, then go with it. Normalize it as much as you can. Even little kids know that we've been living in this weird place. So you wanna normalize it. So you say, so this is what's gonna happen. You give them a little information, right? You give them the plan, cause they're little. You're gonna tell them this is what's gonna happen. And maybe the two of you come up with a little thing that you're gonna do at what I call the moment of goodbye, right? Cause that's, the, that's where all the emotions are. Even for grownups too, right? The moment of goodbye. And maybe you decide ahead of time that you're gonna have 10 kisses. Or maybe you decide ahead of time that you're gonna give each other four high fives. Maybe you hand your little child something, you know, like a little special rock and she hands you back a little special rock. Make a little ritual for this moment of goodbye and very much normalize the fact that this is a time of big emotions. That so, so we want to stay away from that elimination language, right? Oh, it'll be fine, or you won't feel sad, or it'll be okay. You say, of course, the two words that I cannot live without in my practice are of course, right? Of course, you're going to have big emotions during the moment of goodbye. If they say, oh, I feel scared, or of course. So you normalize it, you validate it, make a little ritual, try and contain it a little bit as a moment of goodbye, and then do the drop off, right? And get out, because it's that lingering and that, oh, right? The, the, yeah, it, teachers will tell me all the time, right? Just give them and go. So it's gonna be hard for you, mom. You can cry in the car when you get in the car, or dad, right? But, but keep, it, keep it normalized, keep it upbeat, talk about it, but not too much make a little ritual and, and see how it goes. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Steve? Well, you, the, the question and the conversation makes me think how much kids have to teach adults and how much kids will surprise us. You know, we anticipate <laughs> yeah. and then it just goes a different way. And what it brought back for me is when I brought, dropped my oldest um, off at kindergarten and I yeah. counseled families on how to do it. And I was a mess. And we had done a little ritual, we had prepared and I opened the door and she got out of the car and she walked across the playground and there was a corner there and I was just waiting for her to wave by or to reach out and she just disappeared around the corner <laughs> right into the school. And it was just, it was, uh, I still, re I can still conjure the whole thing back up yeah. for me. She yeah. was amazing. Yeah. And leave room for your kids to be amazing. Yeah. Um, they have a lot to teach us and they have a lot of ideas and they're pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Leave room for your kids to be amazing. That's, that should be on a t-shirt. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it too. Uh, our next question, uh, going to the teenager ages, um, any suggestions for a 13 year old who is scared to have vaccinations? Oh, you get that one, Steve. Yep. Yeah. Um, <sighs> always worth you know exploring the the fear um and to understand where it's coming from it might be just you know the the the, the needle itself um a 13 year old might be worried about what they've read about it or what they've heard about it um it's important to take kids seriously um when they've got a head particularly a 13 year old about what their reservations are and to listen and you know they get to be decision makers um you know we shouldn't do for or particularly for a 13 year old, a sense is really important. They need to agree and be okay with anything. And so, you know, saying that you've got some control over this um, and I'm listening to you is, is part of the conversation. But there are ways to distract, there are ways to make it um, less painful if that's the issue, but it really is engaging in a conversation first and, you know, letting kids control a little bit, like, today, this arm, that arm, um, really how it goes. Um, so, you know, there's, there are more conversations to have about that for sure. But I would, I, I, you know, I would explore that with your pediatrician or family medicine doc when you go in. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a buzzy bee kind of thing that vibrates around there and distracts the nerve endings. And so it really feels a lot different when you use that. And some kids don't know that that's an option. One of the things um, when kids are worried about things, so if you've got a kid who's anxious about something, remember that um, anxiety is fueled by a really great imagination. 
So I always say that I've never met a kid who worries who doesn't have a fantastic imagination. <laughs> so in that conversation, you know, Steve would probably say like, well, what are you imagining or what have you heard about, right? Because they're conjuring up this image. And then I will, when I work with kids about being, you know, I mean, you can imagine like blood draws and shots and cavities and all these medical procedures. Um, I say, so let's see if we can use your imagination that's so fabulous. Let's see if we can use it for good. And right. what can we imagine? And so I do things with kids like, you know, um, imagining that their, their arm um, loses sensation. Kids are really good at, at pretending their arm is numb, turning it into a block of wood. Um, having, I had one, a, a college kid who had a horrible fear for this, of this, and she wasn't going to be able to go to college unless she got some vaccinations that they required. And so we did, I, I made a recording for her that she could listen to and she, what we said, which of course it doesn't make sense, but doesn't have to be, is that she was going to leave her arm in the doctor's office and take the rest of her body to, I forget where she went, you know, to Hawaii or something. So really, really flattering, truthfully flattering a child's imagination and saying, how can we harness this power that you have so that we can change it up a little bit? That's yeah. the way that that's the way that I deal with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna borrow that. Take it. <laughs> I'm, gonna borrow Take it. That. I'm gonna use that tomorrow. Good. <laughs> yeah. And I have another question, but before I get to that, Steve, do you want to address at all what Dartmouth Hitchcock is doing to help families and kids feel more safe coming into clinic, knowing that people are worried about COVID-19? Sure. So you know we've been really really careful. Um, and so, you know, really everyone is screened as they come in. Um, they're asked, have you had any symptoms? Um, fevers and temperatures are taken. Um, masks are available. Everyone wears a mask. Um, and so it's, it's, it's done with kindness and it's done with, this is how we take care of each other. Um, you know, waiting rooms are reset. Um, group, the, the exam rooms are cleaned. A, billion times a day, and I don't think I'm exaggerating. <laughs> um, and we have almost 10,000 people in and out of the Lebanon Dartmouth Hitchcock um, building every day, and we haven't had a single transmission of COVID um, since the beginning. Wow. Um, the person. I know, masks really work. Um, and hand washing really works. Um, and you know, it, a lot of people I work with, you know, it was super scary at the beginning. It was really scary. We just didn't know what it was going to be like and what we might bring back to families. And in March and April were awful. Um, you were worried about the kids. We were worried about everybody. Um, but now, you know, most people say um, they feel safer in the hospital than they do anywhere else because um, these precautions really do work. Um, we feel pretty comfortable and we know that we haven't had any cases. And, you know, my hope is that this, that will be the same for schools. Um, you know, I know, I know it's harder for kids to follow directions 100% of the time, but, you know, there are a lot of layers of protection um, to, that are being thought of. Stay home if you're sick. Please wear a mask. You know, let's respect each other's um, space um, by physical distancing. And those things really work. And so it's safe to come in here. And I think we're so lucky to live where we do. And, in northern New England, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire, our, our rates of COVID locally are just really low. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're so fortunate. And I think that in part, that's a reflection of how we do take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are considerate. Yeah. Thank you for that, Steve. We probably have time for about two more questions. So this one, I'm gonna sort of pare it down a little bit. This person has two children. Her younger child seems flexible, resilient, can't wait to go back to school. They've been practicing wearing their masks and she seems ready to go back. But her older child who's in seventh grade is a little bit more rigid. Some days she seems ready to go back. Other days she's angry about having to wear masks and, and she doesn't wanna do Zoom or remote. So this mom is really wondering, is there a difference and how can she tell the difference between obstinance and anxiety? So she feels like her child's being rigid and stuck Stubborn, but she also recognizes there's real anxiety in there. So how does she manage some of that? <laughs> so if she wasn't obstinate, I'd be worried um, because that's the job of a seventh grader and eighth grader is to develop autonomy, you know, see that adults aren't perfect and, um, and what they say doesn't always make sense. You know, that's developmentally, that's pretty appropriate. Um, 
and that doesn't make parenting any easier, um, you know, but that's, that's part of what to go to. And I, I'd be interested in what you say, Lynn, you think about this, Lynn, is I, I sometimes wonder about, you know, as kids are thinking about school, um, the difference between anxiety and kids that are just naturally introverted and are, ang and, you know, sort of kind of yeah. okay not being around a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've seen that there are certainly, you know, I have I have several of my clients because I specialize in anxiety that when the shutdown happened, it was like a dream come true. They were like, this is the best because school is a stressful place for them. Kids mm -hmm. that are that are more introverted, kids that are a little socially, you know, worry about social stuff. A lot of kids on the spectrum. Um, kids with high functioning autism really enjoyed the remote learning. They enjoyed the independence. They enjoyed not having to deal with people. So there are some kids that are really struggling to go back to school, not so much even because of anxiety, but that, that, that being home felt pretty good to them and that that would be their preference anyway. Um, so um, for, for the mom, is there a difference between obstinance and anxiety? Um, you know, they hang out together. People ask me all the time, I don't know if she's being, I don't know if she's being manipulative or anxious, right? Well, anxiety is really manipulative because it wants what it wants. And we're all sort of manipulative. We're all trying to figure out how to get what we want. And this seventh grader is trying to figure out how to get what she wants. And she probably doesn't have a lot of control in her life. So she's pushing back a little bit. So I would talk to her. It's sort of like what you were saying, Steve, about the immunizations, right? So for a seventh grader, where can you give her choice? Right, so there are, you, you may want to even sit down with her and say, okay, so these are the have tos, right? You have to wear a mask, you have to do this, you have to do that. And this is, this is where we have some flexibility. So let's figure out where we can be flexible. And you, mom, you can say to her, why don't you tell me where you think I could be more flexible? And so let her begin to feel that sense of autonomy because she's probably feeling right now like everybody's, you know, for the last five months, we adults have been telling kids what they can and can't do, and they're sick of it. They're tired out, and they want their normal lives back. So, see, I, I would talk to her about that. I would, I would say to her, I would say to her, where can you be flexible? And say, throw her a bone and say, where could I be flexible in this? Because maybe I'm being a little, you know, maybe I'm a little stressed out. Maybe I'm a little rigid, right? But she's supposed to be pushing back. That's kind of what they do developmentally. Yeah, it's like when they discover hypocrisy, right? That's also a fun moment in parenting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she probably is a little anxious. She probably is a little nervous, right? Yeah. Great, thank you, Stephen Lynn. Um, we are right at 6.30, a little after 6.30, so I'm gonna bump it over to Angelica to wrap us up. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Steve and Lynn, for being with us tonight. Thank you again to Project Launch and the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth. Um, and if you, um, attendees, if you could please, um, you'll get a survey again at the end of this presentation. And if you could um, please fill that out again, that helps us with our programming in the future. So thank you all again for being with us tonight. Um, such great advice and can't wait to use it in my own life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thanks Steve, I wish time. you were my pediatrician. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Lynn, it is great to meet you. It is, uh, thank you so much for organizing this. It's great to, great to have the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Angelica. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Good night.